Good morning, Mercy Hill Church. How are we doing this morning? We're doing good? Right on, right on. My name is Dylan, and I'm on staff here at Mercy Hill. My actual, let me fix this real quick, sorry. Hope that's better. Uh, My actual focus is Salt Company. So if you're a Xavier UC student, give me a little whoop whoop. Wow. That's about the only thing I'll ask you guys. I know it's summertime, so I'm sorry about that. (laughs) No, we really are excited to be here today. Um, We are actually, there's a lot of reasons to be excited. One is that this is the very last passage that we're going to in the book of 1 John. So I will be concluding this book. We've been in about three months or so, I believe. And so I'm really glad that y'all are here because we get to finish this book together. And if you look at this passage that we're going to go through pretty soon, you can tell that John doesn't want to finish this book. He finishes in a really weird way, and it kind of reminds me of, if, you're, if you've ever written a letter before, I know it's the 21st century, so maybe, maybe we don't write letters anymore, but if you've ever written a letter and you write, start in really big font, and you're writing, dear mom, well, I don't know, dear mom, you're writing, I love you so much, this and that, and then you get down to the bottom and you realize that you have like one inch left, and you're like, wow, I have like a whole paragraph of thought that I need to put in here. That's at least what I did. So I put down like a little one inch font, I'm like writing on the margins. And honestly, I I think that's what John is doing in this situation. I don't know if he like ran out of parchment paper or his messenger is like, hey, John, like it's enough. Like I gotta catch my flight or something like that. Like I gotta go, I gotta send out this message. But John is (laughs) an absolute love of the church, an absolute love of Christ. And he he doesn't wanna stop writing. A little bit of historical background about John is that we think that he was probably one of the youngest disciples of Jesus at the time when, when, when he was walking through Jesus with his ministry, uh, maybe 12 to 15 years old, actually. But now he's an old man in this situation. And he's actually one of the, he's the only disciple that wasn't killed for his faith. Um, now, he was actually, you know, legends say he was actually tortured by being thrown in boiling water, and then he was exiled to an island. So he definitely didn't have it easy it's possible that he's one of the oldest believers left here on earth at this time. Kind of think about that. One of the the last few people that have walked with Jesus that saw him and knew him and had a physical, personal relationship with him. Um, My sister's in town. Um, She'll be here for the next couple days. Um, Really excited to have her here. Um, But our, our grandfather actually passed away this past December, 91 years old. That's, he was an old man. <laughs> he really was. Um, and I just think about him talking. Um, he grew up in Baton Rouge um, his whole life, Louisiana. That's where, where I'm from. And he talked about how much, just in his lifetime, um, just society had changed. He said that he could ride his bike all the way from one end to the other of the city, and now it's you know, bumper-to-bumper traffic. Um, He talks about the school systems. He talks about the crime rates, you know, just old people stuff, right? Just all the the whole gambit when when you'd go over to his house. Um, But the thing that that freaked him out the most was just how much our our culture has changed our view of Christianity. So I don't need to go into the details there, um, but um, he knew that when we were going to help plant a church in Cincinnati with a bunch of people, many of which my age, Um, I'll be 25 in a month or so. I could tell that it brought him life because he said, I'm sure he was thinking, you know, what if Christianity ends with this generation? And that's exactly the same thing that John was feeling. So as he writes this letter, he is here to give us confidence. He is here to write so that we may know a couple of things. So those things that we want to know are this. We want to know that we, if we're believers in Christ Jesus, that we are free from sin. He wants us to know that God has given us an intimate relationship with him. And finally, John wants us to know that there is nothing else better than this relationship with Jesus. We live in a society, we live in a culture where we are very much swayed by our feelings. Whatever you feel is what you are, and that's what you can be. I mean, we just had a huge pride parade just yesterday downtown. Many of those people were there because of their, they've let their feelings direct them. Now, we're called to love those people. 
We're called to love everyone. But this is the culture that we're in now. And so John, in one of his last words that he writes, he's telling us to have confidence that we may know. So we may not just have this emotional response to the gospel, that we can have confidence in our head and in our heart of who Jesus is. And so that's, that's what we're gonna be going through this morning. So if you would, please pray with me, and then we'll begin the text. Dear Lord, we thank you for this morning. God, thank you for using broken vessels unlike us to just pour out your glory. God, when we are weak, you are made strong. I pray that you would humble me and the congregation this morning to accept your word as truth and to live differently because of it. We love you, Lord. Amen. Okay, so 1 John chapter 5, verses 18 to the end, verses 20, 18 to 21. I'll begin. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who was born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the only true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. So I want to go ahead and stop at the beginning of verse 18 when it says, he, everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning. Now, what does this mean, does not keep on sinning? Now, we've actually gone through this before in 1 John chapter 3, verse 6, talking about continuing to walk in darkness. Now, if you're a believer in Christ Jesus, our eternal life has been changed from this point on until eternity because of the blood of Jesus. We were disobedient, just like Adam and Eve was in Genesis, you can read about it. And from that moment on, it brought a chasm, a separation between our relationship with God and our relationship, um, our relationship between God and man. But that doesn't mean, when, when Jesus came back to life, excuse me, let me rephrase myself. When Jesus came down to earth and lived the perfect life that we couldn't live, he died the death that we deserved, but was resurrected three days later. We are now free from the eternal consequences of sin. So when you read this, you may be confused. You may be thinking, well, wait a second. As far as I know, I still sin. At least I know that's true of me. So this doesn't mean that if you're a believer in Christ Jesus, that if you sin, you're not a believer anymore. That's not the case. No, this is actually talking about this continual habit of sin. So if sin is continuing to pervade in your life, continual habit of the same sins over and over and over again, then there is a serious problem with that. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more. But why does sin grip so closely to us? Why is it so hard? Well, the Gnostics of the time, this was the, the false teachers of the time that John was writing, believed that actually sin, excuse me, actually flesh, our physical body and our spiritual body were actually separate from one another. So I'm sure if they read something like this and read this letter, they would go, well, yeah, you've stopped sinning because if you put your trust in Jesus Christ, now your spirit is separate from your body. So now it doesn't really matter what your flesh does. You can sin as much as you want because your spirit is safe. But that's not, that's not what we believe in. We believe that we have been completely transformed that yes, our flesh will decay and rot away, and yes, our spirit will continue on, but right now, it's together. And I wonder, what, like I said before, there's a strange thing of why sinning feels so good and why it's so difficult to, to get out of grips with. And the reason that I think it is, is because sinning actually feels pretty good. It feels pretty good in the moment, right? For example, if you're on the way here and somebody pulls out in front of you, you like curse them out. That felt pretty good, right? Just being honest with you. You're like, man, that person got in my way and now I wanna kind of show that person that I'm frustrated at them, right? Or maybe, maybe you're 19 or 20 and you go out, go out to the bars on the weekends and you get drunk with your friends 
because you want to prove something maybe, or you just want to kick back and blow off some steam. That feels good in the moment because you have control of your decisions. You can do what you want to do. Or maybe it's even something like looking at pornography, right? After a long week of work, maybe you're stressed out, maybe you're, maybe you're exhausted. And so you'd rather take control and forsake the relationships of your friends or family and to dive into something like that. See, all the things, all those examples I gave, they feel good in the moment, right? Because you have control over your environment. That's what we want. We want control. That's what sin says, that I know what's better for me than God does. But these can have extremely drastic consequences. Consequences that actually put Jesus Christ on the cross. So I say that not to condemn you, but to bring you hope, to make you realize how powerful the gospel truly is, that while we were still sinners, Christ loved us. See, he took away the eternal punishment of sin and death. But we don't believe that there is a, you don't have to work to get to heaven. You're completely free from the works of sin in your life. But that doesn't mean that we're completely safe. So I wanna break that down a little bit. So please look with me in verse, at the end of verse 18. It says this, but he who is born of God protects him and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are from God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Now we do not believe that there's this thing called prosperity gospel that we do not ascribe to. When we read this, I think you can have that lens very easily. You can go, oh man, God is going to protect me from all of the things in this world. I won't have any more temptation anymore. You know, if I put my trust in the Lord, I'm gonna be set free from, from these fleshly desires that I have. Disease won't affect me, violence won't affect me, financial strains won't affect me. That's what a lot of churches actually teach in this country, that if you put your trust in Jesus, your life here on earth will actually exponentially get better. We went to Ames, Iowa this past weekend, uh, Seth, Tim, and I, part of the Salt, Com Salt, Salt Company Conference, so... Our church is a part of a greater network of churches. There's college ministries all over the country that are doing the same thing that we're doing on Thursday nights and local churches that are doing the same thing that we're doing on Sunday mornings. And that we're impacting university cities around the world. And so we had, excuse me, around the uh, country and around the world, I guess. So we had people from Gainesville, Florida, Fort Collins, Colorado, Syracuse, New York. It was awesome. It was like a big family reunion. But something happened in Ames, Iowa um, about three weeks ago, the very first session of their summer um, salt ministry, a man came and he got out of his truck and he opened fire and he, and he ended up killing two of the students that were there. When you read this passage, you can think to yourself, well, God doesn't protect us. That instance right there is in a church parking lot, right? One of the safest places you could possibly be. In Ames, Iowa, of all places, it's definitely not like Chicago or anything. Like it's a completely different place. But evil is still in this world. It was actually a very humbling experience. We all walked in and the first night that we were there, they just had a panel up on stage and they just walked and talked through the different, uh, the, the different uh, stories of these people, it was about 400 people present. Think about the amount of scar tissue that that brought up. When they went from story to story, the different perspectives of the people that were in that um, situation, I could tell that they were just grieving so much and it hurt so bad. Most of all, the loss of, of three lives, including the shooter himself. But you see, they were grieving what happened, but they, they had not forsaken their love of Christ. It was actually really cool. One of the girls that spoke said that the two girls that had gotten killed, they were believers in Christ Jesus. And so that moment where their life ended here on earth, they didn't call it the place of their death, they actually called it their heaven spot. And I thought that that was so amazing. See that 
God has taken the teeth away from sin through his son, Jesus Christ. He protects us from the eternal punishment that comes from our disobedience in God. That's what he protects us from. In Romans chapter 12, it briefly talks about how we are heirs of God, but that, that if we are to be heirs, then we are to also share in the sufferings of Christ. What happened to Christ, y'all? He was put up on a cross and killed. So it doesn't relieve us from the pain and suffering of this world, but it gives us confidence in the future that we have in heaven. So you could be thinking to yourself, okay, I want to know this. I want to know this truth. Even if you're a believer in this room, you may have been for a few years now. I, I want to know this truth, but I don't feel it on a day-to-day -day basis. I don't feel it. And again, I'm kind of going back to that feeling thing. John, John cares about your feelings, but he wants you to have confidence regardless of how you're feeling. But how can we grow in that confidence? Well, the biggest thing, and this is our point number two, is that John wants you to know that Jesus wants an intimate relationship with you. He wants you to know that you can have, you can be locked in with the Lord in your day-to-day -day life. Read verse 20 with me. It says, and we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true and we are in him who is true in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Now again, John is combating the, this false teacher of the day, this Gnostic people. Well, Gnosticism means knowledge, and they believed also not only the flesh and spirit being separated, but they also believed that they had this special kind of relationship with God that nobody else did. And so if you wanted to have this cool secret knowledge, you had to kind of get into their club, and then they would divulge their secrets to you of what Jesus told them. It was false. It was a lie. They were trying to polarize themselves. So this hit right here, this was a direct shot at these people that said that you had to do more things to have an intimate relationship with God. That's, that's not what John is saying. He's saying, and we know that the Son of God has come and, and given us understanding. You could be saying to yourself, how has he given us understanding? Well, there's three different ways that he gives us understanding. One, he gives us the Holy Spirit. If you're a believer in Christ Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. He's given us the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of us. He's given us the spoken word of God that is spoken to us. And then he's given us a gospel community that surrounds us on a day-to-day -day basis. And when I was growing up, I'd put my trust in the Lord at a young age. I was about nine years old. But I really wasn't walking with the Lord, if that makes sense. Like it was really my it was really my parents' faith, my family's faith, and my sister is actually a huge part of that. I'm just really thankful for you. But it wasn't until I was about 15 or so where I started to really want to step out my faith on my own. You see, I'm I'm a bit of a people pleaser. I like I want people to like me. Simply put, <laughs> I want people to think that I'm cool. Um, that I'm creative, that I'm, that I'm funny, you know, just fill in the blank. Just chasing after the wind, honestly. But particularly in high school, I just wanted to be one of the cool kids. And so I'd go to parties. Um, I wanted the girls to like me. I would do things that I probably shouldn't have. I'd stay up late, come home late, all this stuff, because I wanted people to like me. And then there was one party I was going to. It was, it was getting later into the evening, and I remember I'd pulled up, and I, I knew that I shouldn't be there. That's the thing. When the Spirit's inside of you, you're just like, I was like man, I, just, I know that this isn't gonna fulfill me. I'm just gonna do it anyway. And I remember there was a moment where I believe the Holy Spirit kind of prodded me and said, Dylan, this isn't you. You're better than this. You're a new creation. And it wasn't like somebody spoke from the clouds or anything. It was just something in my heart that I... I felt like, okay, this is, I need to get out of this situation. And so I, I got out of there. Hey, the Holy Spirit does things like that. It's given us understanding to where we can discern the good from the evil. Just like we've talked about in the book of 1 John, saying that the world is blind, stumbling around in blindness. They don't know their right hand from their left. 
The Spirit has given us something unique. It's given us discernment of what's right and what's wrong and how we ought to walk. So I thought to myself in that time, okay, I'm out of here. I went back home, but I really didn't know what to do next. And so one of, there was a few believers at my school that were teachers. And so I talked to, to one of them, Coach Tupper, love that guy. And I asked him, what should I do? He said, well, when's the last time you read your Bible? I said, oh, I read it on Sunday. He said, well, yeah, everybody else read it on Sunday. <laughs> when, when, what other day of the week have you read your Bible? And I realized that I was just kind of going through the motions and that I wasn't having that intimate relationship with God. You see that the Bible that you're holding in your hand right now is God's perfect spoken word that he has given to us, transcending generations and generations, and it is alive and well. And regardless of how old you are or what situation you is, if you open up the word of God, it will read you. You don't read it. It's pretty amazing. So I said, okay, let's, Let's read the Bible. <laughs> I'm 15 years old. This book's about 2,000 years old, right? It's a little tough to read by yourself, especially if you haven't read through it very much. But I, I, I want to point back to Proverbs 16:16, 16, 16, when even when it seems kind of difficult to go through sometimes, that there is riches in there. It says in uh, Proverbs 16:16, 16, 16, "How much better to get this wisdom than gold." To get understanding is to be chosen rather than silver. Understanding the word of God and going through it and learning more about who God is and who we are is more important than any of the riches that you're accumulating for yourself, any of the relationships that you're in, any of the health kicks that you're in right now to try to get fit. Whatever, whatever you fill in the blank, learning more and diving into the word of God is of the utmost importance. But like I said, at that time, I was 15 years old. I had no idea how to read it. So I, I just prayed. I was like, God, I need, some, need somebody that can help me. I need some people around me. And around that same time, um, I went over to a friend's house not too long afterwards. And we got on a conversation. And there was about two or three other guys there that were in the same situation as me. That was my gospel community right there. See, the people that are around you, they're not just people that come in and roll in and just sit in the pews or metal chairs next to you. If you're a believer of Christ and they're sitting next to you, that's your brother, that's your sister. We have to continually speak the word of God to each other. We're here to encourage one another. We're here to challenge one another. There's a really cool quote um, by this adventurer theologian professor named John Donne. And he, it, you, I'm sure some of y'all have heard it, but it says, no man is an island to himself. We're not made to live on an island. There's a reason that Paul and, and a lot of the apostles call the church the body of Christ. It's a makeup of everyone that have different roles and different um, giftings and different talents that are used to edify and build up the church and ultimately glorify the head, which is Jesus Christ. So the people that are around you, these are the people that you can look to in the hard times, in the good times, that you can be challenged with, that can help you through difficult moments, that can pray over you, because they have the same spirit that resides in you, the same one that resides in John, right? The same spirit. And if you live on an island, I feel like some of y'all have seen this movie, Castaway. I don't wanna be like talking to a bunch of footballs. I wanna be like talking to real humans. And so this is why it's so beneficial to live in the body of Christ. And so if you haven't made this church or another church your home yet, I would, I would encourage you to do so, believer, because you can't do it by yourself. A lot of people think that you can, but you can't do it by yourself. There's this passage in Philippians chapter two, and it says this, is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ, any comfort from his love, any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another and working together with one mind and purpose. It's an amazing passage. So as I have grown 15, 10 years ago, right? 
It's been pretty bumpy. It hasn't been easy. But through these different things that the spirit of God, reading the word and spending time in community that has propelled me outwards into the world, I believe that I've been able to slowly but surely grow into my intimate relationship with Christ. And I'm a young man. I, I pray however, Lord, however long the Lord gives me that well into my 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, I'm continuing to grow that relationship with Christ. And I want y'all to also have that same spark inside of y'all as well. And finally, we can know that there is nothing else better than this relationship. So if you look at verse 21, it's kind of a weird way to end, right? Again, it's kind of back to the parchment thing. I think he just ran out of paper. Um, but I feel like this is a poignant way to end this letter. And he says this, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Also kind of strange that he's calling a bunch of, you know, adults, little children, right? Again, going back to my granddad, he was 91, I was 24. If he calls me son or kid, it's not in a condescending way. It's not in a way to try to bring you low. This is, this is family, remember? We're talking about the body of Christ. He's writing to the believers to encourage them and to show that a deep affection and love that comes from being in the family of Christ that nobody else has. So the little children thing is not to make you feel bad about yourself, but it's also a way to give humility to you as well, to keep you humble. Because little children, they're kind of goofy, right? <laughs> I mean, honestly, most of them. They're a little silly. They do some goofy stuff. And most of all, little children are pretty weak too, right? You don't see like a four-year-old lifting weights at the UREC, right? Like that's not gonna happen. They're pretty weak. So John also recognizes the place of where the church is right now. But to humble ourselves as a little child and to take instruction and love and discipline as like a father or a mother does to a son or daughter, that is a great place to be because that is how we grow. Now this word idols, we don't really hear it very much anymore. The first thing I think of when I think of idols, I think of like those Easter Island heads I'm like, I'm, I can keep really far away from those because they're like on an island in the Atlantic Ocean or something like that. I, like, I don't have to really worry about idols, right? And especially in this time as well, there was stone carvings everywhere. They had this massive temple of Artemis in the city of Ephesus. It was huge. Very easy, I guess, to stay away from these idols. But I think that John is writing this because he knows the power of the world. He knows the power of this culture, of the world that these believers are living in. And although we don't have these stone carved images that much anymore, especially in our own culture, we can make pretty much anything an idol. I brought this book up. As actually, I was walking out the door. I thought, man, this, I think this would help. It's by Timothy Keller. It's called Counterfeit Gods. Incredible book. I highly recommend. I'll leave it here if somebody wants to, wants to borrow it. But he breaks down what an idol is very well throughout this book. And I just wanted to read a quick excerpt of it because I feel like he's going to do a better job than I. So he says this, what is an idol? It is anything more important to you than God. Anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God. Anything you seek to give you what only God can give. An idol is whatever you look at and say in your heart of hearts. If I have that, then I'll feel my life has meaning, then I'll know I have value, then I'll feel significant and secure. There are many ways to describe that kind of relationship to something, but perhaps the best one is worship. Doesn't have to be a stone image, y'all. I hope that as I was saying that, that quote, that y'all are thinking about the things in your life that constantly vie for attention, that you constantly wanna take down the pillar of where God should be, and you take that down and you put something else there. Maybe it's relationships. Maybe it's your marriage, or maybe it's your idea of marriage. 
Maybe it's, it's relaxing, right? Maybe it's, it's playing too many video games. Maybe it's your grandchildren. Maybe it's your career. Maybe it's just having people approve, like, approve of you and what you're doing. Like I said in the past, that was one that I still, I still mess with. Whatever it is, it says that you can worship it. See, that God designed us for worship. He designed us to glorify him. And if we're not glorifying him, we're, we're going to glorify something else. That is, that is our, in our DNA. That is what we do. We worship something. So I have a question that I wanna ask y'all with that too. You just fill in the blank here. It says this. Is this activity, blank, object, relationship, making me more like Christ, or is this making me look more like the world? I feel like that's a really helpful test and indicator. If this, is, if this item or object is pointing me more towards God or more towards being like the world, which is stumbling around in darkness, guys. So for those of y'all that didn't know this, I thought this was pretty cool. The Secret Service does more than just protect the president. I know this is so random. There's more than just protect the president. They also deal with helping take the circulation of counterfeit dollar bills out of, out of like our banks and things like that. Kind of a strange combination, but that's what they do. Now, they may be run out of a job because we're all going, you know, digital now. But when you first think about it, you go, okay, well, how do they identify counterfeit dollar bills? Do they like find the factories where these guys are like making the dollar bills, do they, they know all the different kinds of paper or ink that they use to fake the dollar bill? No, they don't do any of that. All they know is that they just know what a hundred dollar bill, a real one, really deeply looks like. They know everything about it. So that if one of them passes in front and it's not the right one, they know immediately. What is that for y'all? What is that in your life? that may pass in front of your view, that continues to pull you away, that's counterfeit. Because what I'm saying here and what John is saying here is that to grow in the understanding and knowledge of God means that everything else is garbage. When we think about it, guys, majority of things that we have, pretty much everything we have is either gonna end up at a goodwill or in like a garbage dump, right? All of the relationships we have, however strong or rich they are, even the, even the healthy, godly ones here on earth, they're only gonna last as long as we last here. Your fitness, I already know, man, I have, I have declined quickly in my athletic ability recently. It's only gonna go downhill from there. Like whatever you fill in for what can make this counterfeit God in your life, I'm asking you to point back to Jesus, believer, so when those things pop up, once again, you know, without a shadow of a doubt, that having a relationship with the Father, having the Spirit of God dwell within you, having the Word spoken and read through you, and being surrounded by your gospel community, that when something else comes up in, in its place, you know that that's not of God. And you can turn away from that, and you can turn to Christ. So as John like rushes to finish the the parchment paper, right? I want us to also have that same sense of urgency as we go back out um, into our classrooms, into our homes, into our places of work and play, that we can have the confidence that regardless of what this world is saying about who God is or what they believe in, that we wouldn't be tossed to and, for, to and fro by the waves, but that we would have the confidence that comes from knowing God on an intimate level. Like I said before, if this isn't your church family, I would love for you guys to consider joining us because I believe that we're running hard after what God has for us. Now, we're not doing it perfectly. So you have to ask for a lot of grace. We're a lot of broken people, but the Lord is using us in our weakness, I believe, and he's continued to give us favor. We'd like y'all to join. So we have things like the Gospel 101 class. We have connection groups throughout the week. We have ways we can teach you how to read scripture, how to pray, how to spend time with the Lord. 
because that is the ultimate relationship that is going to last in eternity. Please pray with me. Dear God, just thankful for this time we can spend in First John, closing it out. God, you've been so good to this church. In our first year of ministry here in Cincinnati, you've been doing ministry here so much longer. You definitely do not need us to be here, but you want us to be here so that we can see the wonders of your work. God, I pray that we would have the utmost confidence and would continue to grow in confidence as our relationship with you, Father, continues to grow. God, I pray for um, our congregation. I pray for my heart, Lord, that we would continue to spend time in prayer and understanding of who you are, Jesus. That we can open up your Bible. We can open up your word. We can see what it says. See how good and how powerful and how loving and gracious you are and how we are not, how we are broken and sinful. Yet you love us. God, I pray that we would lean in to these gospel-centered communities that are just like little beacons in a very dark place, in a very dark world. Because though the evil one may have control now, it's not gonna last forever. Our eternity has been sealed by your precious blood, Lord, and I pray that we would live into that today, tomorrow, and forever. In your name we pray, amen.